One of the problems is that most people think that they are not affected by it. Most people think that these, that these tricks, these manipulations work on other people, but not on me. I know how it works. I'm smarter than the rest. We like to believe that other people are easy to manipulate, but we are resistant to it. We are resilient. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective on important societal issues. Produced by Soapbox Media. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. In this episode, I'm continuing to provide a free public service to educate the world about cognitive bias. You're welcome. Today we'll be exploring how the multi-billion dollar global marketing industry is implicitly given moral license to exploit our cognitive biases and how to prevent falling victim to this ethically questionable practice. If you like what you're hearing, please press like on your podcast app. Uh, I'd love to hear from you on our Facebook group, The Rational View. Dr. Marco Kovic has a background in political science and communication science. He's a lecturer, researcher, author, and activist in the areas of decision-making, cyber psychology, misinformation, and conspiracy theories. Dr. Kovic, welcome to The Rational View. Thank you. So could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in cognitive bias as a topic? I think my, my main ramp into this topic wasn't so much academic, but mostly my own biographical experience. I grew up in the 90s and I was really a kid of the 90s. I loved everything that was kind of paranormal and out of the bounds of science. I, I was a big X-Files fan, but I believed all the stuff that came with it in the, in the 90s kind of pop culture. I believed in UFOs, I believed in Loch Ness Monster, I believed in, in Bigfoot and all of that, and it was in ghosts and, and paranormal stuff. So that was kind of my, my up bringing my socialization. And then what happened was that 9-11 came around, 2000, 2001, I think. We, you and me, we remember it. We are a bit older than maybe yeah, some yeah. people who listen. And I really got into 9-11 conspiracy theories. And then this kind of hobby I had for a long time became serious business because it became something that kind of consumes. So you believe that there's bad things going on, like powerful people in the darkness, controlling all the stuff. And once I managed to get out of these 9-11 rabbit holes of conspiratorial thinking, I was just fascinated by what was going on in my head. Why was I believing the things I was believing and why, why do people in general believe this? And how can we help people get out of irrational belief systems? Interesting. So you were, you had fallen victim to some conspiracy theories and, and you saw the light effectively, you, you realized that there's some weird thinking patterns going on here and you wanted to explore that. That's very interesting. I think seeing the light is the correct expression. I am to some degree a, a convert and as converts tend to do, they are very strong in the new beliefs they hold. <laughs> so what is cyber psychology? That's an interesting term I've never heard before. That's a term that is also a bit of a marketing trick, to be honest. It is just psychology applied to the domain of mainly online interactions, online communication, online behavior. It's maybe not a psychological domain in and of itself, but it is, I think, a topic that is becoming more and more important because the internet is where we spend a lot of our lives these days. Yeah, I did a, a couple episodes a, a little while, uh, not too far, not too long ago on uh, social media warfare and the uh, the way that um, people are trying to influence your mind and, uh, you know, win your vote, for example, or, or you know, definitely a lot of political subterfuge and, and troll farms and bots out there trying to, being paid to, to win converts, I guess. So you're, you're deep into that, uh, fighting that battle. I'm trying to do my part. Yes. And all of these, th these things, as, as you know, as we know, they are not new in and of themselves. Influence operations are as old as, as human society is, but today with the internet, with online communication, with social media platforms, 
the cost of of manipulation is as low as as probably never in history and some of the things that are being done are highly effective so the problem is i think has today or is is at a scale that is that has never been seen before interesting so in in 2016 you and uh, natalie lesu published a paper titled Consuming Rationally, How Marketing is Exploiting Our Cognitive Biases and What We Can Do About It. Now, the abstract of this paper says, our tendency for irrational decision-making is compounded by marketing, which is little more than the art of exploiting cognitive bias. Shots fired. Are marketing practices unethical? I think that's a very interesting debate. In my view, they mostly are. People who do marketing will say, no, of course not. We are not forcing you to do anything. We are not restricting your choices in any way. We are just trying to persuade you to, to make you do something we would like you to do, but you don't have to do it. But I think that it is unethical in that it is a form of subtle manipulation. And manipulation, even if it is, un, if it is done gently, is not morally right, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's one reason that I started this podcast is to, you know, fight these cognitive biases, these thinking patterns, which lead to irrational public policy that can hurt people. Um, And I think marketing is trying to do the same thing, which, you know, people go to school to learn how to exploit cognitive bias rather than to counter it, which is what we're doing. So I, I feel almost an opposition there. And I'm sure you, you do as well. What, what are some of the cognitive biases that, that marketing professionals like to exploit? I think there's a, there's a number of them. And maybe to preface that, marketing is something that has also been around for a long time. So when we talk about these problems, it's not just something that happens today on the internet. But again, I think some of the problems, and maybe we'll talk about this, are amplified online because it's much easier to influence many people. Um, one of the classic things that we encounter in marketing is maybe you know the phrase sex sells. It's a very, it's almost a cliche, a stereotype in a way. But what happens there? When we see attractive people doing something with a product, with a service, their attractiveness, their physical appearance has nothing to do with the product itself. If, if the person I think is attractive is buying a cheeseburger, I don't know if the cheeseburger is good or not, just because the person is buying it. But we have an inbuilt bias called the halo effect. So when we see, for example, a person that has some positive attribute who is attractive, we intuitively think that this positive attribute is somehow indicative of other positive attributes of that person. So we think, okay, if this nice looking person is buying a cheeseburger, is doing this in an ad, well, then the cheeseburger is probably pretty good because the person is nice, nice looking, is, is, is uh, nice on the eyes. And this is used in many, many ways. So it's not only physical attractiveness, it's often, for example, prominence. Is a person well known? So we see this in advertising all the time. Famous people advertise for things that they have no connection to, but because they are famous, their fame is kind of a halo that they project onto the product they are selling. And we all for it. Yeah, despite the fact that they may have no expertise at all in what they're discussing or they have, you know, they're like a sports figure. Why do they have any idea about whether this or that product is any better, any more than you or I would, for example? Exactly. Maybe you have heard of Tom Brady. Probably, yes. Yes, yes. One of the most famous football players. And he was shilling for, I think it was FTX, the, the crypto company, crypto exchange that collapsed a couple of weeks ago. And people were buying into it, investing into, into FTX because Tom Brady was doing advertising for them. But Tom Brady has no specific knowledge in economics, no specific knowledge of cryptocurrencies, and no specific knowledge of apparently scams. <laughs> Yeah, no, I see what you're saying about the halo uh, effect and and the fact, you know, especially in beer commercials, you see, you know, 
uh, beautiful people, very fit men and women in bathing suits, drinking beer. You know, this is not truth in advertising. When I see people drinking beer, most of them have beer bellies and they're old and sad looking, but... (laughs) But maybe that's just the circles I, I hang around in. <laughs> that's, that's a good that's a good uh, insight. So, how best can people combat these these attempts to deceive us? How do we combat the the effects of marketing? I think it's very difficult. One of the problems is that most people think that they are not affected by it. Most people think that these that these tricks, these manipulations, work on other people, but not on me. I know how it works. I'm smarter than the rest. And this effect is known as the third person effect. We like to believe that other people are easy to manipulate, but we are resistant to it. We are resilient. And everybody believes that. So in some, it can be true. And another problem here is the overconfidence effect. We think that we are better than other people at, for example, resisting manipulation attempts. But again, most people think that, so it can't be true. When you ask people, how well do you drive? Most people will say, I, I'm a, an above average driver. And this has famously been studied in, in multiple studies. But of course, it can't be true. If everybody or disproportionately many people say I'm above average, it, it doesn't work. So I think that the first step to building some resilience against marketing is what I like to call intellectual humility. It's just realizing we are far less rational than we like to believe. We can operate in day-to-day things fairly well, but when it comes to these subtle manipulations that use our biases, which we are not aware of, we are quite bad at, at realizing we are being tricked with. Yeah, I think that's one of the the values of of what we're doing here is is to, and a, a previous guest said, you know, you shine a light on the biases so that people can recognize them, and that's you know your first step. And I think, from my background of having a, a scientific education, you're you're trained to recognize various cognitive biases, confirmation effects, observer biases, and experiments, and and cancel them out. So you know, I've, I've got a head start. But, this, you know, I want to share this to, to everyone listening. Uh, it's really important that we understand what these biases are and how they're being exploited. So, you know, it's a great service that you're doing, uh, shining a light on on these things. How, how do you uh, promulgate your, your views? Do you, do you um, publish papers? Is that your main uh, way to, to go about getting this out? Or what, what's, what's, what do you do? That's a little bit of what I do. But, for example, I was a teach a course on applied rationality. And that's something that I enjoy very much because I work with, I mean, it's quite popular right now with about six to 70 students per course. It's, it's at a local university here in Switzerland. And we do a, a bit of a theoretical background, of course, but a lot of applied stuff. So we try to learn about tools you can use and use them in your own daily context. And what we talk about there are three basic approaches. One is debiasing. That's basically what you talked about now, shining a light on, on these issues, learning about them, being more aware of our cognitive limitations. The second thing we do is we learn about nudging. We learn about how these subtle manipulations, how these tricks work and how to spot them. And the third thing we do is an approach called red teaming. Red teaming is something that comes from military and intelligent contexts. And those are tools that are very, very practical. They have little theoretical backgrounds and you can use them in, in, in things like uh, project work or in, 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 well, basically in many practical contexts that you, that you encounter and that are of some kind of relevance. Could you expand a little bit on, on, on what red teaming is? I've never... Uh, encountered that term before. Well, how, how, do you, how does that work? So the basic, very basic principle of red teaming is having an, a devil's advocate in a way. So I think the principle itself was established in the Yom Kippur War in, was it 1967? Something like that. When Israel was attacked 
from uh, two sides by, by Arab nations. And the historical context was that the Israeli intelligence was aware that there was a military buildup on the borders, but they refused to believe it. They said, no, they won't attack us and they won't especially attack us on Yom Kippur, our holiday. But then it happened. And then the, I think it was the Israeli military intelligence department introduced this red teaming principle. They called it a different name, but I, I don't speak Hebrew, so I'm not going to try to say it. And the principle there was that far-reaching big decisions that are made have to be critically challenged by a group who is trying to debunk it or show the opposite or, or just find flaws in the reasoning that led up to some decision. And it was... I think it last about 20 years kind of taken out of this military context and introduced in civilian contexts. And it's basically a tool set of methods you can use to identify flaws in reasoning, especially before you make a decision. So that's something that I, I like quite a lot. That sounds uh, very similar to the what the scientific method is supposed to be, um, where you come up with a hypothesis and then everyone tries to debunk it. Um, you know, someone will publish a paper and, and everyone will, will try to poke holes in it. So it, yeah, it's a very uh, well demonstrated process to get to the, the truth with scare quotes around truth uh, for those uh, who don't believe in it. <laughs> it's, it's in a way just applied skepticism. So that's what we do in, in science, what the scientific method is. And red teaming is a little bit less complex than the scientific method, but it's also basically a form of skepticism towards, towards other people, but also towards yourself. That's true. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a skeptic uh, by practice. Uh, you know, again, that's part of the scientific training is, you know, science is just applied skepticism. And skepticism, I think, has a bad name in uh, th amongst the general public, um, you know, you you're not open to ideas. Uh, pe people will 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 argue that skepticism is is a closed mindedness, but not being skeptic is being way too open minded. I think. Um, and you mentioned earlier that you loved the X Files as a, as a TV show, and I couldn't stand that show because of the lack of skepticism. <laughs> it was always the 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 conspiracy theory that was true and the, <clears throat> the scientific character on that was always being uh, embarrassed or, you know, showing that they're wrong is, oh God, as a skeptic, I was, I hated that show. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one of the things that pop culture, I think, does with us. They teach us in TV shows, in movies, in books, that the people who are skeptics, who question things, who don't just believe the most convenient explanation, are usually wrong. And the person who, who, is, who has the courage to, to believe something despite or in spite of a lack of evidence is the correct one. And I think in reality, it's the other way around. If you just believe things without having good reasons for believing them, you will usually be incorrect and maybe make very bad decisions. But it helps you um, belong to a group, right? There's, there's a, tr there's an innate tribalism in people and they want to belong. And, you know, the, you know, you see this in religion, especially, you know, belief is held up as, as one of the key values in religions in the absence of evidence, faith, right? This is, this is what faith is in, in science. Faith is a, is a four letter word. Um, but in religion, uh, it's, it's, it's lauded as, as, as a goal, so we've got this this kind of dichotomy of thinking that, uh, and, and it's hard to attack that if it's it's a it's a really a core value of some people. How do you how do you address that? Is there some way to to say, well, look, you're maybe a little too open minded in some cases? One of the strategies I use when I talk to people who are conspiracy, maybe conspiracy adjacent believers, because with hardcore conspiracy theorists, it's difficult to to even talk about anything. But people who are kind of on the fence, I try to appeal to their sense of rationality and to their sense of skepticism and critical thinking. Because most people say, I am a critical thinker. I don't want to believe things. I, I want to just question things. And I try to appeal to them and say, you're exactly right. We have to do this. 
but we have to go just one more step towards that direction, towards that goal. We have to also question the things you believe and so far have not questioned. And this can be a strategy for finding some common ground. Mm, yeah. Um, I, I've, you know, researched this a little bit. I'm not a, not teaching it at a university, but it seems like to reach people, you, you need to have a connection, some sort of an emotional connection before they will listen to you. And you can't just come out as in, in the internet to where you're, where you're on social media, most people just come out swinging with evidence. Like, here's my evidence for this, here's my evidence for that. And people will double down on their beliefs or their confirmation biases in that case, rather than listening and getting to a conversation. You really need to find that common ground, I think, as, as a first step in introducing people to questioning their beliefs, perhaps. Um, so that absolutely yeah. that's really uh, a beneficial thing to remember when you're when you're discussing it's difficult when you're on social media to to be that sort of if you've hear, heard the the tired old arguments again and again uh from coming from some group uh you know the the, the tenth time you hear it your patience wears thin and i think those of us who are trying to defend skepticism need to be wary of of the fact that this wears you down <laughs> exactly yeah and I think social media is a is a different kind of venue, a different kind of forum than dialogue, which is face to face with a person. So what I like to say is when you talk face to face with a person, you need to do exactly what you described. You need to overcome this tribalism we all have. You need to overcome the intergroup bias because be it conspiracy theories or other rational beliefs, it's often not about the facts. It's it's about a sense of belonging to a community of people which share values and share beliefs. So it's exactly as you said, you need to find this human connection first. And you, you can do this by, by, by just being open-minded in a way, asking questions, being friendly, stuff like that. But when it comes to public communication, it's much more difficult. My experience, and I think your experience was, was similar or is similar, it, it's difficult to really talk to people online about facts because it, it just devolves into, into this tribalism, into, into bad faith attacks. So it's, it's difficult to have a rational dialogue. So maybe online in, in a public setting, things like debunking, just talking about the facts isn't a bad idea because even though you might not reach people who are most affected, you might reach people who have not yet made up their minds. Mm -hmm. I think the vast majority of people are fence sitters, uh, quiet, um, coming for information rather than uh, espousing a particular viewpoint. Uh, and those are the espousers are the ones that kind of dominate the the interactions. So you're, you're talking to the silent majority. Um, so I think uh, the marketing stuff that you're talking about is is, is very important. Um, but also the how to approach people is also very important. If you look at um, the tribalism problem, I, I saw an article recently that was showing that people on, you know, and Democrats and Republicans, for example, in the U.S. have very wrong opinions of the values of the people in the other tribe. They, they effectively demonize uh, the opposition, uh, and it's because... I don't know, because they don't mix enough or they have, you know, they really have very similar core values. They're not that different, but their impressions of the other side are, are, are that they're horrible people, that they eat babies, that they're lizard men, that, uh, <laughs> you know, the impressions are amazing. It's because they don't get outside of their echo chambers, I think, and, and the social media enforces this. You get to hear what you like. Uh, and, you think, and it serves you stuff that can, that supports your confirmation biases. And you really have to make an effort to get outside of that, to, to really get into the conversations in the other groups. I think that's a, a difficult challenge. Do you talk about that in your course? Yes. And this is something which, in my view, is a big, big problem. But not just in a, in a specific, like, small local setting. How can we talk about this with other people? 
but on a, on a like make macro kind of level democracy perspective. We know, I think, from the research, from research from the past 20 years, quite, I mean, it, there's always the different strands of research, but I think the, the brunt of the evidence, a lot of evidence points towards increased polarization, increased kind of building of echo chambers. And this brings us back to marketing. It is, it is, this dynamic is influenced and, and increased and made stronger by, by the architecture of especially social media platforms. So even if we say, yes, I want to hear from other people, talk to people who have different opinions, it's made more difficult because of the ways in which social media platforms just technically, technologically operate. And that, that is a, a, in my view, a big, super big challenge. And so far we have almost no, no answers to that challenge. Yeah. If you, if you post things to your, um, to your tribe that resonate and, and support the confirmation biases, you get this, this boost of likes and the, the adrenaline hit and, and, and all of the endorphins that you get from, oh, people like my message. But if you go the other way and you, you step across the chamber, you get laugh emojis and you get attacked and it's very, it wears you down, right? It's, it's not something that is easy or, or enjoyable to do in any way. <laughs> This is, I think some, we, we, we don't realize this, but this is completely new in the human experience. We didn't have this back in the day. Before the internet, we, we had local interactions for the most part and local reactions. So you didn't talk to 10 million people, you talked to 10 people. And it was a completely different scale of interaction and of, of reactions. And what we also didn't have was the algorithms or the just the technological, technical, the technical tools and steps used to induce more in screen time and more consumption of social media. So once you, for example, you see some viral post from your own tribe, you like it, you reshare it, this increases the probability that the algorithm will show you more of the same stuff. So even though you don't want to actively the algorithm, the platform is building an echo chamber for you and not because it's bad, they don't have bad intentions. Their only goal is to have you in front of the screen as long as possible. And that's a very effective way of doing that. And that's to show you ads, right? This is how they make money is, is selling advertisements and having uh, a consumer uh, basically being um, nudged uh, for money. <clears throat> so any, any platform that's free is not really free in that they are, you are the product. They're selling exactly. your attention to marketers. Uh, and so, you know, take, take that with a grain of salt. This is not a free platform. I mean, it is a free platform, but it's not free to your mind unless you can, um, take Marco's advice and, and shine a light on these things and, and, de-bias yourself. <clears throat> so in, in your paper, you suggest, uh, perhaps tongue in cheek, uh, that people get a tattoo on their hand to remind them to think critically before they make a purchase. Uh, <laughs> do you have such a tattoo, Marco? You hold up your hand? <laughs> Not yet. But something that I do, that I really do when it comes to online shopping, for example, I um, generally logged out of all the online shops where I shop. So I'm not constantly logged into Amazon. I'm not logged into other online shops. And this introduces a little bit of friction, which has prevented me in the past from impulse buying stuff. So even small things can help you a little bit. And this is an example of, in a way, nudging yourself. So we have to be constantly nudging ourselves to, to realize that we're being uh, bought and sold by marketers and our attention is being... Uh, bought and sold. And I think, you know, in a lot of cases, this is becoming more and more insidious and more and more um, everywhere. Uh, because these these systems are so good at learning our preferences, you know, as we post online and interact online uh, and respond, they, they learn. And I, I was uh, able to 
look, I did a little bit of work on artificial intelligence, uh, some some interviews and podcasts on on how artificial intelligence is is getting smarter, and there are, are, are services you can get. There's one called Replica, which basically uh, learns about you, and 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 you know, they, you can use that to uh, replace you effectively online. Make posts just like you. After a while, it, it learns how you interact, and it. It looks just, it could replace your presence online, which is a scary thing for uh, for identity theft, I guess. Um, it's it's like a Black Mirror episode, basically. Yeah. It's becoming real. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very realistic and, and, you know, interacts like a person. I think the, the Turing test is, is, is losing its effectiveness as, as a way to tell people from bots. And I'm, I'm looking forward to... to uh, investigating this further because there's a new one that's just come out called chat gpt which is really crazy uh in terms of you know sounds like a person it seems like you're talking to someone who understands what you're saying and is thinking and responding to you so these things are out there and and they're and the the social media platforms are using that to market to you so you know should we just surrender (laughs) i mean these are the these are the machines that that beat the world chess champion or these, these things are now being used to, to, to fry our tiny little, uh, primate brains. I think the feeling you have expressed is one that uh, we all kind of feel as individuals. This is like a huge machine operating over our heads and operating in a way in, in, in our homes, everywhere we are. And it seems impossible to do anything about it. You can, go off the grid and live offline, but that's, that's really difficult. Most people can't afford to not be online. And many of those platforms are useful. I mean, I, I'm also on social media. I like being on social media, connecting with people, talking to people. So I, I don't want to give that up. And I think there's maybe two levels of, of doing things. One is the, the level of, of being cognizant of things, building up individual resilience, which we are talking about today. And the other level is, I think, governmental regulation. I know it's not not a cool thing to talk about regulation, but that's something that will need to happen at some, some point. We regulate all industries, all businesses, and for any kind of business which produces negative externalities, which, is, you know, which, which does some societal damage, we say, that's not okay. You have to change this and you have to pay for it. And the only exception we have are social media platforms. And I think we need to start treating social media platforms the way we treat other businesses as well. If you do harm, if, if your business practices are, are dangerous and, and risky, you have to change something about it. Mm-hmm. And that, that does seem like a necessary step. And, and, you know, privacy is something that we don't seem to have anymore. We don't have an expectation of privacy on the internet and people are willing to, to sign away their privacy rights for every app they load onto their phone. You know, these things are listening to what we're saying. They're, they're peering at us through, through the lens of the camera. And, you know, some people like getting targeted ads, right? This is something that they want, you know, no, no matter how spooky it is, that your phone is picking up on what you're saying and serving you uh, ads uh, based on listening into your private life. It, it's, it seems very insidious, but it's something that people don't care enough about to say, no, I don't want this cool social media app. I'm willing to give away this amount of privacy. Are you a, a privacy person when, you know, when on the internet, do you try to hide as much as possible? Or are you out there with, with, with everything? To be honest, not really. I think I do what most people do. I, I often choose the, the path of least resistance. So when I use social media, I just use it. I don't really think too much about it. But I also sometimes do use like private mode, incognito mode in my browser, just to see, for example, when I book a flight, what the price is without all those cookies and all those the Facebook surveillance pixels and all that stuff. And it, it can change, for example. I think one of the, maybe the overarching problem here is we, we live in an era of what is sometimes called surveillance capitalism. 
So I think this was a foundational sin, a foundational problem of the internet that the business model of the internet is surveilling people, collecting people's data and transforming the data into products that are sold to other people in order to sell us stuff back. And it's interesting when you do a service, for example, most people will say, no, I do not want to give all this private information to those companies. But then on the other hand, everybody is using those services. And why are they doing this? And I think one of the answers here are so-called dark patterns. The social media platforms, all those apps we use, they are created in a way to trick us into behaving in ways which are detrimental to us, which we otherwise would not choose. So one, one trivial example of this, of a dark pattern, if you create an account on Amazon, for example, or on Facebook or, or on any of these big platforms, creating an account is super easy. It's like done in two minutes and then you can start shopping, start posting, whatever. But if you want to delete the account, it's very difficult. On Amazon, it's, it used to be, I didn't try it in the past couple of months, but it used to be almost impossible for a, just a normal human being to find where exactly you can delete your account. You can do it, but it's so well hidden in a menu within a menu within a menu. And this is a dark pattern that is known as a roach motel. It's easy to get in, but it's very difficult to get out. It's like the casinos in Las Vegas. They have the escalator going up, but just stairs coming down. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And casinos are a funny example. I mean, many of those these bad things have been perfected in casinos. Casinos typically don't have windows. You don't have daylight. Why? Because casinos want people to, send, to lose their sense of time. If you don't see what's going on outside of a window, you don't know how long you've been in a casino. So that's one of the, of the many manipulation techniques that have been perfected in casinos. And there's an analogy that, that I like. I don't know how, how correct it is, but it's fun. You have one-armed bandits in casinos, like the machines, the slot machines. Yeah, yeah. And apparently the neurochemical mechanism going on in the brain is very similar to using an app today on a phone with update when you pull down to update it. So you kind of pull down and you have the same expectation. Something is going to happen and maybe I'll get lucky. Maybe I'll get the notification I've been waiting for all day. Is it, that's, that's an interesting behavioral uh, observation. Um, yeah, I have the same thing. You know, I think it's why I like fishing. You don't know what's going to come out, right? Yeah, this time it's going to be the big one. Uh, <laughs> And, and you make the observation that stores are also, um, or casinos are also uh, designed to play to our cognitive biases. And I think in stores, they, they, they actually use smells that, that cause people to, to, to purchase more. Like we're, we're being manipulated by, the, by the, the smells in our environment and the music and the layout of the store to, to do things that are not to our advantage. They're to the store's advantage to take, to extort more money from us effectively for things that we might otherwise not want. In your paper, uh, you ask the intriguing question, could irrational consumer behavior also have beneficial effects? What was the, what was your answer to that question? I haven't read the paper in a couple of years, so I'm not sure what we answered there, but maybe my reasoning was can we use irrational behavior patterns for good ends, for good causes? And that's a philosophical question that is talked about a lot. So in moral philosophy, you have two main schools in a way. One school is deontology, which says, well, no, this would be wrong categorically because you are using people kind of against the will. And the consequentialist school the main branch there is utilitarianism, is more focused with the outcomes. So, okay, maybe we are manipulating people, but if we are manipulating them for a good cause, maybe that's okay. And sometimes I talk about, yeah, sometimes I talk about maybe two sides of, of the tobacco industry. 
So if you are manipulating people into starting to smoke, that's a bad thing in my view. But if you manipulate them in order to help them stop smoking, I think the the manipulation itself is maybe still bad. But given the positive outcome, I'd say morally, this is less bad than making people start smoking. Okay, it's a a relative moral, relatively moral compared to the obviously immoral uh, alternative that has been going on in the past. The do the ends justify the means, and 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 how in 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 this marketing thing, you know, you we suggest that manipulating people in itself is bad, and that I think is most people would agree with that uh, is morally questionable at least. but is this a zero sum game? In other words, can both the marketer and the consumer benefit from this because the end goal is a better situation? So you're asking the question, are there moral manipulations? That, that's an interesting, it's a very interesting thought because, you know, and this, this comes up against the very, very basic freedoms of, of people uh, to, to be, "Quote unquote," you know, self-determined or free to to do what they want, but by manipulating them to do something that's good for them, is that a bad thing? That, what's your opinion? So I think within the narrow problem of consumerism and of a capitalist or market free market oriented economic exchange, I would say I wouldn't know of a situation in which this would be justified. Because ultimately, when it comes to the profit motive and making money by manipulating people, I don't think there are really situations in which you can say we are manipulating them for a good cause. But in non-profit contexts, when it comes to things like health behavior, for example, We had the COVID pandemic not so long ago, and in a way, we still have it. There, I think it was justified to try to use subtle tricks to induce pro-social and risk-averse behavior. So we had, for example, in Switzerland campaigns that uh, were trying to signal to people, hey, if you... If you wear face masks, if you if you adhere to non-pharmaceutical and pharmaceutical interventions, you are helping yourself and you're helping other people. And this is kind of a social proven nudge in a way, and maybe a form of social pressure, but I think it can be argued that it is justified. What what do you think about this? Yeah, no, I I generally agree with that that statement um i'm it's not something that i want to participate in personally um my goal here is to uh make people aware that they're being manipulated um and i'll let others walk down that pathway um i'm not going to oppose uh such efforts i think uh as you say something that's for the the public good uh, there, there's an there's a strong argument, I guess, that um, you want to use all the tools at your disposal for that. Um, last question for you: If I could grant you one wish, how would you want to change the world? That's one question, but it's a very, very big one. I'll I'll keep the things that are feasible realistically. I mean, I would like to be king of the world, dictator of the world, but I think that's not (laughs) a pretty idea. But in the realm of things that are possible, I think we would do a lot of good if we change the way social media platforms operate and how they are regulated. I think that platforms need a different kind of business model. The surveillance capitalism advertising manipulation model is something that we've been trying for the past 10, 15 years, and we now know the outcomes are not great. 
I would either like to see different business models and stronger regulation in favor of the public good, or maybe different kinds of social media platforms altogether, non-profit platforms, platforms that are, that are real public venues, public, public squares, in which we are not the product, in which we are the users, the citizens, the people who hold the power. That's very, uh, that's a very good idea. Um, how do we get there? Is there, a, have you, have you thought of the pathway to, to change? Is, is it just government regulation and, and pressure uh, from the people? I think, uh, I think those are two important levers. So right now there is some government regulation in the European Union, for example, we have the, I mean, I say we, Switzerland isn't in the European Union, but I'm, I'm also Croatian and Croatia is in the European Union. So I can say we, we have the digital services act which was enacted not i think it was last year or this year i'm not sure and they have a little bit more regulation for example when it comes to abuse on social media that social media platforms have to cooperate with with police with authorities and like in when kids are bullied online for example stuff like that so that's important but i i would really like to see much more engagement and and maybe even protest activism from civil society this is something that doesn't really happen right now it's not really happening and i think we need this kind of organic bottom up pressure which is ultimately the only thing that will sway social media platforms as long as the users don't don't make demands don't don't rebel in a way social media platforms have no incentive to change change things and governments as well they they respond i hope to some degree to to what is going on in the population what what can users do i mean we're all kind of bought into these major social media platforms to get our message out what can we do as as individuals to put pressure on the owners, the, the profiteers that are making profit, selling our attention? I think one of the things we can do as individuals is say, well, I disagree with these and these policies, this way of doing business, and I will stop using this platform. But that's very difficult, we know this, because if everybody else is on the platform and I leave, it's a cost I'm paying, but nobody else is paying, and it's, it's a problem. So what I would really like to see is more, uh, in a way, collective action. I think we need, maybe a movement is too much or, or too, I mean, it's, it's a nice idea, but kind of a movement for better social media would be nice, but it's unrealistic. But I would like to see more organizations, uh, more groups, more collectives that are trying to at least raise awareness for these problems. I think many people, probably including you and me, we feel kind of lost in this sea of, of big tech. More voices, more organizations, well, not necessarily governmental. I think we need organizations who are independent, who are, are fighting for a, a better public sphere in the internet. That is something that could, I think, mobilize a lot of people. Well, that's, that's a very good message. And thank you for, for joining us on The Rational View, um, Marco. So for, for taking the time to come and chat with us today, I'm going to send you a, a Rational View t-shirt. Uh, so thanks very much for coming on. Thank you, Al. Cheers. If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at The Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing, please consider visiting my Patreon page at patreon.podbean.com slash The Rational View. Thanks for listening.